inside of yourself because part of this is things that are to yourself are below the horizon, things that are more public is above the horizon, and the thing that shines in the light of day is your occupation. Okay? The 11th house, if this is short-term fun, this is long-term plans. Helen, a quick question. Yeah. If there's a correlation between 10th and 4th, mm -hmm. would it also mean, like, if there is mother, father, but land in the 4th house, would that be your connection? You inherited from your father. Okay. Yeah. Most of those rules. Okay. So it's not a religious connotation for connection to the land? No. Okay. Not that I'm aware of. Twelfth house, finally, let me give you from the book that I recommend, there's a wonderful scenario to understand the twelfth house. Imagine that you're sitting on a bench outside of the courthouse. In the morning, you just filed for bankruptcy, and in the afternoon, you just completed your divorce. There's two ways that you can feel sitting on that bench. Mm -hmm. You can feel, oh my God, it's over. Or you can feel, oh my God, it's over. <laughs> Twelfth house experiences are like that, okay? Depending on how you see it. In modern astrological parlance, it's the house of self-transcendence. In older terms, it's the house of troubles. <laughs> Because these character building things typically are not things that we want to go through. And it's how do you shoot yourself in the foot? Okay? So we've got all of that. And these are very basic meanings, right? Now, here's something that I learned from horary astrology. And I'm going to go through different branches kind of quickly. But horary is where you have a question, and it's a burning question, and you ask me, and I do a chart for it right now, and I can answer your question. All right? It's a form of divination. And it was actually very popular in medieval times because most people didn't know when they were born. <laughs> so you did a chart for the birthplace and time of the question. And you could get some really cool and accurate answers that way. But in order to do that, there were what was the subject of the question? And so the house was the critical thing. If your fish was stolen, you know, where were your fish? You know, well, it's, you know, things that you own. So you had to look at the ruler of that house and that sort of thing. So they figured out, maybe even before that, but I know that the highest use of this following trick was in horary astrology. Remember I said that here's the other person and this is what they own? Okay. Well, this is their brothers and sisters. Okay. This is that other person's father. This is that other person's ability or ability to have fun, okay? This is where the other person shoots themselves in the foot. So imagine that you can take this dial of the houses and simply kind of spin the dial to get further meanings from the houses. So for instance, if your brothers and sisters are down here, then this is what your brothers and sisters own, okay? And this is their brothers and sisters, like maybe you only have a half brother, okay? Or this is the short journey they're going to go on. So if you go to a horary astrologer and say, my brother's going on this trip, you know, and it's less than 200 miles, but will he make any profit from it? You know, well, here's the trip, and then there's gonna be another place for the profit from the trip, but basically you take everything from starting from there. So you have your minister's money, your minister's um, brothers and sisters, your minister's wife. So you can start to derive all of these from just spinning that dial around. So here's my favorite thing. Your dog's fleas. Okay, here's you. Where's your animal? Six. 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 Now it's got an animal. Okay, so here's its first. Second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. Your dog's fleas is the 11th house. Okay? 
remember, this is the important thing is to count from one here. Okay, these are numbers that start with this, not a zero. So it wouldn't be over here, one, two, three. It's one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so your dots, fleas over, are over there. In the same way, um, problems that you will have from sex are fourth house because here's sexuality and the twelfth house from the fourth is the problems of it. So any house, any attribute, the one right before it is going to be the one that will show you where the problems are. The ruler of the nation is the tenth house. And where did the rulers run into problems sometimes? <clears throat> Henry VIII, <clears throat> the church. <laughs> okay, there can oftentimes be an antagonistic thing there. Okay, so, uh, so that's houses. So, one way of looking at this is you have the actors, okay, and you have the role that they're playing, which is the zodiac sign, and you have where they're doing it, which is the house. Nice little metaphor for things. So if you put things together, uh, here's one example. Arnold Schwarzenegger in Kindergarten Cop. That's not a tumor. <laughs> Arnold Schwarzenegger, a very Martian kind of character, right? He's in Cancer, the mothering sign. Okay. Does Mars in Cancer do well? No, that's why it was being used for comedic effect, okay? And it's probably in the fourth house of childhood and taking care of kids, okay? So you can do all sorts of interesting things with this. Um, and in fact, let me show you something very briefly. I need four volunteers, okay? Four, come on up to the front, form a line. Three of you. Now form a line this way. This way. Over, over there. Over here. Oh, yes. Yes. There. We don't follow the direction. Line. There. There. Okay. Good. You're going to be the subject. Okay. Now there's a little branch of astrology called experiential astrology. Okay which I'll get into in a bit. But you can actually start to get the feel for zodiac signs from doing experiences, okay? So, I'd like you gentlemen to keep your line. She's going to try and break through it. You're gonna try and walk through them. Right, right, notice what it's like, okay? Now, I want you to notice also what's your feeling of not being able to cut through. Okay? Notice there's like, oh my God, can I do this? All right? Okay? Now, there are a number of strategies that you could use. Okay? There's directly pushing through. Okay? Right? Give that a try. See what it feels like. Okay? Resistance. It's resistance. And notice the feeling in yourself, too. Okay? Can I do this? Can I get through these guys? Okay? Then there's... That's uh, not a stance that I would take. She might take a different tack. <laughs> yes, and it's entirely possible to take that tack, okay? And the way of doing that tack would be maybe a different kind of sign or a different way of writing, okay? If I was Martian trying to get through these guys, okay, I might do the direct, okay, rah! okay? If I was being Mar... That's Mars and Aries. If I was being Mars in Scorpio, I might like, look over there, <laughs> okay? A little tricky, deceptive, all right? Or I might want to, you know, duck underneath their legs, all right? Now, what I just put up there was a barrier, okay? So this is a Aries kind of experience, fighting through the line, okay? Now, we're gonna do something a little different. I'm gonna give you a different sign. All right, now, each of you three line up one in a row, okay? Yes, and these are stations, and each of them is gonna ask you a question, all right? And you have to get the answer correct, okay? So come up with questions, okay? He's first. What time is it? The clock's 
tell you that. Yes. Yeah. Give him the answer. Oh, 12.23. Okay, good. He passes you on to the next one. Notice what it's like. You got confronted with something. You had to answer, but now you're moving. Okay? And you get to the next stage. What's six times three? Six times three. Great. Now you get to the last stage. What do you want? <laughs> Food, actually. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. Good answer. Now, this movement has a mutable quality. Questions have an intellectual side. This could be considered a Virgo experience. Okay. Get the idea? Yeah. All right. You can all sit down. There's a little piece there of experiential astrology. And if folks want to get together, you know, one of the better ways of doing astrological study to get it into your bones, get a group of people together and come up with exercises like this, okay? What would it be like to go through a Scorpio experience? And what I do with that is, I have people imagine that they're right at their deaths and, and trying to see what it is in their life that had meaning. All right. If they're going through a Virgo process like that, what are the questions? Okay. If they're challenged with, okay, now be a Leo. It's like, okay, how do I feel being on stage? <laughs> okay. And what happens is your own chart will interact with that. Okay. If you don't have a lot of Aries in your chart, being confronted with three guys that you've got to fight through, okay, might be more of a challenge than if you have four planets in Aries. Okay, very different kind of thing. Now, it's been said that um, the first experiential astrologer in the West was a guy named Marsilio Ficino. Uh, he wrote a book called Three Books on Life, which interestingly enough was also the very first directory of occupational medicine. Because really what it was doing was saying, what do you do with all these melancholy scholars? Okay, you give them experiences that are opposite to melancholia. Okay, and so Ficino had those kinds of things, and of course, the whole idea of creating talismans and things to create the opposite effect is also somewhat experiential too. But in any case, that's some stuff that you can do. You can also think, what's some music, you know, uh, that would fit each of these signs? Listen to them. Pulse the planets is really nice to be able to get that. I mean, dun, 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 you know, that whole opening bar of Mars. Okay, gives you the feeling for the planet Mars, but also that's really kind of Mars in Aries is what he's doing with that. Okay, so one of the things that's really good when you have trouble memorizing this stuff, if you really want to get it in your gut, go through these kinds of experiences, listen to them, see what fits. You know, um, you know, the, the, any kind of poem you can project onto and see what what are some of the things that might fit with that. You know, um, here's an example of, yeah, here's Mars and Cancer, okay? She hears me strike the board and say that she is under ban of all good men and women being mentioned with a man who has the worst of all bad names. And thereupon replies, but his hair is beautiful, cold as the March wind, his eyes. There goes that Mars, totally dissolved in cancer. What's a dad going to do? That's, called, that's from A Woman Young and Old by Gates. You know, I love it because of that contrast. You know, really neat. So ways to learn some of these basics. Let me go briefly. We're almost out of time, and I still have to run through things kind of quickly. Ladder history. We have all of this astrology that happened, and then, and then Copernicus came along, which was an excuse. Okay, if you talk to some modern historians, they'll say, oh, the Copernican Revolution is what destroyed astrology. Actually, the English Civil War has something to do with that, according to one of my teachers, because the English Civil War got all of Europe, all of the royalty, really kind of nervous. Okay, if they could start deposing kings and things like that. And what they found was that, oh, astrology and all these almanacs were very powerful propaganda tools for both sides in the English Civil War. So 
one thought is that the nobility started to disparage astrology as one way of taking away a propaganda tool. Also, yes, at the same time, uh, roughly, there was Copernicus. Although, interestingly enough, there was strong scientific evidence to argue with Copernicus at the time. They did not have good telescopes. They did not know the actual size of stars. And some of those things were critical questions that really were not fixed until later when we got better instruments. In addition, Copernicus was it ran into his own problems not having ellipses for orbits. And a lot of people don't know this, but Copernicus and his system actually had epicycles, the planets going around in little, you know, little circles as they're going around the sun to try and correct for that fact that they weren't perfect circles. So there were problems with Copernicus and whatnot, but astrology fell out of favor. And then what wound up happening, especially on the English side of things, is it dropped out of being studied, the Latin and the Greek uh, manuscripts weren't looked at. And in the 1900s, the 1800s and the early 1900s, not many people were doing much with it except for maybe a few theosophists. And because Freud came along and because some of them got charged with fortune telling, they got up in court and said, no, this isn't fortune telling, it's psychology. <laughs> And what wound up happening as a result of that was it started to get watered down in the 20th century. Now, let me say that I can look at a chart, and being a psychotherapist, I can start to sort things out and get a fairly good idea of what's going on with the person, especially when I'm in dialogue with them about what the chart is about, so that I'm not projecting, but rather saying, this is what these symbols could mean. How's the feeling of that in your life? And you will see that these things start to fit together. So the chart can easily be extrapolated to a psychological instrument. But that's not all that it was. It literally, the only part of you that was yourself was that first house in medieval and Renaissance astrology. Everything else was the stuff in your life and the things that you owned to the people. Okay, So very different way of looking at things. Plus, they didn't understand about essential dignities, which I talked to you about earlier. They didn't understand the very basis in the Western tradition, the, the hot, cold, wet, dry, the, 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 the whole sense of seasons and how all of these fit together. So a lot of it got lost. And then somebody put in predictions for the royal family in a newspaper. And at the end of that column, they said, oh, if your birthday is from here to here, you'll find these kinds of things happening. There was, it was actually, there was a guy who came up with and invented sun sign astrology. And the newspaper sold better. And they said, can you do this some more? And that's where all of those columns came from. OK? Yes, because the sun is the only regular one that you can tell for groups of people. OK? Let me give you a little hint. OK? If you want to make good use of sun sign columns, don't do the daily ones. OK? Do weekly to monthly. Okay, that'll at least give you kind of the climate that you're in. Don't use your sun sign, use your rising sign. It'll increase the accuracy more. But remember, this is going to be kind of like a weather forecast. Okay? The day might rain, but there may be sunshine too. Okay? But it'll tell you if there's going to be some rain roughly. Okay? That's the best way to make, make use of these sun sign columns. Okay? Use your rising sign. That's really you. Much more. I'm much more of a Capricorn because that's my rising sign. Yes, I've got a lot of planets in Pisces. That would be easy to see for a psychological astrologer. But Capricorn is really pretty strong for me. For God's sakes, I'm in black. It's Capricornian, you know? So, let me, oh, I, let me crunch the rest of this. Just to give you an idea of all the different branches of astrology, and some of them are written on the back of your handout here too. There's mundane astrology that looks at things, political astrology basically, and weather. It looks at finances, what's going on with the stock market, what's going on with the price of beans, what's going on with the political situations and when will things change. Uh, there's birth horoscope, and there's all sorts of ways of looking at these birth charts. There is the German system that looks at not just where the planets are, 
but where are the points of where the planet's energies come together? So if you have Mars energy and Sun energy, that midpoint is going to move as those planets move, and you'll be able to predict things from the blend of those two energies. Um, there's humanistic astrology, which came out of the 60s, okay? Dane Rudyard has almost incomprehensible books written on that, um, because he's so, like, anyway. Evolutionary astrology is something relatively recent, mostly based on Pluto. Um, that's the usual use for the term. Uh, there are entire courses on it. You can do all sorts of analysis of Pluto. Um, the classical schools, Greek and medieval stuff, in the last 15, 20 years, we've started to translate all of that. And we've started to resurrect these old ideas. We've gotten uh, systems of prediction now that are much more accurate. When I started studying medieval astrology, I asked Robert Zoller, why do I want to learn this old stuff? And he said, because they were accurate in prediction. And I said, why was that? He said, because if they weren't, their heads got chopped off. <laughs> So they understood certain things. And there's experiential, which I gave you a little bit of an idea of. In the highest level of experiential, it's really kind of cool. They actually have done this a few times. You hire a bunch of actors, and you get the person's chart. And you get the person standing there, and the actors are told, what's the scene? And it could be Mars in Cancer square a Venus in Libra. And they're told how to act these, and then they combine and they go, is that familiar? <laughs> Sometimes the person's in tears. They say, yes, well, how do you know what's going on in my head? Okay. Horary has just been resurrected in the last 30 years. There are wonderful courses out there, some of them extremely expensive, but it's a wonderful branch. I mentioned that earlier. Ask the question, get the answer. The highest level of this, the favorite example is, there's an astrologer named Alfie Lavoie, former um, NFL hockey player. Now he's a financial astrologer and does horary. Somebody called him and said, Grandpa's will is somewhere in the house. We haven't been able to find it. We've torn it all apart. The message was left on his machine. He took the time that he got the message, did the chart, called them up and said, it's in the attic in a metal box behind panels of wood. Knock along and see where the hollow space is. He nailed it. Okay. Electional astrology is where you're trying to elect to find the right time to do something, okay? There are many systems of that, some of them more complex, some easier. Um, medical astrology, yeah, there's modern medical, there's also the classical medical where you have to really understand the humors and things are not described as this is a pneumonia, this is, you know, a wind in this blah, 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 okay? Um, predictive astrology, there's all sorts of different approaches to that, lots of different schools and methods. And then other cultures, Vedic and Hindu, okay? Huge courses. There's actually a guy here in Chicago who's really good at that and teaches. If you're interested, I can let you know. Uh, there's Burmese astrology, Mahabot, um, which is actually a relatively simple system. I hope to learn that at some point. Chinese astrology, completely different, yeah. okay? You really have to understand Chinese philosophy to get into that. But once you do, you then have mastery of Chinese medicine and, and uh, Chinese martial arts and all the rest. Mayan astrology, somebody has sort of resurrected it from what we can figure out. There's one guy who's actually made a decent attempt at it. Tibetan astrology still exists. It's a sidereal astrology, mostly done by um, Tibetan monks who are in exile. And then there's all the made up ones, like Native American and Celtic and all the rest, which could be at best be defined as unverified personal gnosis in these regards, okay? Resources for study. Um, on the back of the sheet, I talk about all the different types. Uh, beginner's books. Listen, there is one book that if you're going to learn, yes, it's psychological, but you don't get a good writer who's also a good astrologer very often. That book is called The Inner Sky. It's by Stephen Forrest, okay? At one point, he got a phone call from somebody saying, your book is really wonderful. Would you like an endorsement from me? He goes, uh, well, thank you for the comment. Oh, who is this? Oh, I see in a band called The Police. <laughs> so on the front of the book cover is a blurb from Sting. Okay. So that. Astrology Alive is for experiential astrology. The Changing Sky is Forrest's book on prediction, which is also pretty good. Uh, he also has a book that he wrote with his wife, Skymates, Volume 1 and 2, for, you know, like, 
Um, how do two people and their horoscopes combine? Predictive astrology, the eagle and the lark, I actually like better than the chorus book. Uh, that, has give, that gives you really solid stuff about um, predictive astrology. And then Prediction in Astrology by Noel Till. It's out of print, worth finding. His Solar Arcs is, is the next best thing if you can't find that one. Um, Till has his own way of putting things. He's very much a modern astrologer, but it's a nice book. The Classical Revival, I give you websites there for people if you want to learn the old stuff and really get a handle on it and get a good idea of what the tradition is, where it fits into everything. Um, Benjamin Dykes is a PhD philosopher who started to translate things after he studied with my teacher, Robert Zoller. Rob Hand, who now has a PhD from Catholic University, he did his dissertation on the use of astrology in the Italian civil wars, and especially Bonatti and all of that. And uh, Lee Lehman, who's a PhD actually in botany, and could tell you a lot of things about uh, Culpepper and uh, astrology that way, but she's also one of the world's experts on these older forms of classical astrology, like horary, electional, and whatnot. Uh, always good resources, and any books by them or translations by them are really good. Folks, we've already run a little over, even though I started late. Um, hopefully, I've given you at least a taste of this, why it's important, why you want to start to get and study and get an idea of this, because it weaves into the warp and woof of the Western esoteric tradition. And hopefully this will be a good beginning for you and an idea of at least what this domain is like. So thank you for having me today. I really appreciate it.